Good afternoon. This is Lane Hartzell with Seoul Global Study Group. I'm here with Dr. John Wecker, uh, Charles Stewart University in Australia, and also the Australia Center for Applied Philosophy and Ethics. John, welcome today. Nice to see you again. Yeah, thanks, Lane. You too. I'm going to tell a photo in here on you. Um, today I wanted to talk to you about IT and uh, human enhancement, nanotechnology, a couple areas that you are expert in. But first of all, I wanted to ask you, when, when you were first studying philosophy, what were the main influences and, and what were you doing at that time? Well, when I st started um, working in philosophy first, well, particularly in my PhD, um, I was mainly interested in issues <coughs> So issues to do with uh, philosophy of language, philosophy of science, metaphysics, epistemology, that sort of thing, not, not ethics to any great extent. But I was uh, working in, on my dissertation on people like Thomas Kuhn and his, um, his discussion of paradigms, um, various other people who talked about things like conceptual schemes, Donald Davidson was one, uh, Paul Feyerabend was also into into this, um, and I was also looking at people like um, like Hilary Putnam. Their work was also relevant. Uh, and what interested me really there was looking at uh, different ways of of viewing the world um, in Kuhn's terms, using different paradigms, um, but trying to find a way of keeping all of the good points of what Kuhn and others were saying about paradigms and conceptual schemes but not falling into some um, unacceptable sort of relativism where anything goes uh, because that fairly clearly um, isn't, isn't right I think and from that, well later on then I got into the ethics of technology and science uh, but the work of, of Kuhn and these others certainly um, is relevant to that. Yeah, Kuhn's work is really uh, primary to right, right as the information technology revolution occurred. And then, of course, you went, you went into that uh, area looking at um, you know, IT development, surveillance, and so on. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, when, when you started to see this happen, I guess this would have been in the 70s, early 80s, uh, what were you writing about at that moment? Well, back in the 70s and 80s, I have to confess that um, I wasn't really looking or thinking much about the ethics of either science or technology. I was more interested uh, so purely in, in uh, the epistemology and metaphysics and so on. Um, I was certainly interested in the relativist uh, side of things and arguing against that. My interest in the ethics really came later because I had this background in philosophy and then I um, started working in IT uh, and had a, so I had a background in that. Uh, and then through those two interests um, started combining them and looking at the ethics of um, information technology and then later uh, the ethics of nanotech and ethics and philosophy of technology more generally. In the, in the case of uh, anything goes kind of a relativism, it, uh, obviously people don't really believe this, even if they say they do, uh, because if they are sitting in a building making this argument, then the basic uniformity of nature is holding that building up through Newton's laws and Einstein's uh, relativity and so on. So uh, the relativistic ar argument doesn't really hold up. I think it was Hilary Putnam was asked this at one point and he said, well, uh, then we should run out of this building because it's going to fall down at any time. Well, I think that's right, um, and, and um, I always found it and still do very annoying when people um, 
talk more of that because I think they're saying something significant, but um, I mean, I don't think it's realised how, how silly it really is. That's right. Our everyday life is, uh, we're always uh, making choices within a fairly uniform uh, field, you might say. Uh, when you yeah. read when you read the physicist, I mean, it gets pretty deep. But I think for what we're talking about, there's a fair amount of uniformity. I'm trying to make sense of that without falling into some sort of objectionable relativism. So that was really what my uh, what my PhD was about. Uh, but I've had an interest in sort of philosophy of science for a long time. Uh, ethics of philosophy to ethics of philosophy and science a bit more generally. The, uh, the work by Thomas Kuhn at that time was, of course, ground, uh, ground sh uh, shaking uh, when he wrote The Structure of Scientific uh, Revolutions. And, of course, out of that came all of the, the, the explosion of IT, uh, which, of course, you got interested in. Uh, in. In the early days, of course, Drexler wrote his book about uh, nanomachines and nanotechnology. And IT, did you ever think at that time that IT and nanotechnology would be maybe where it's at today? When I was looking at Kuhn, I wasn't looking at, at these other issues. No, that, um, that only developed, well, my interest in that developed more, uh, more recently, but there clearly are, are strong links, particularly, uh, well, if you, I mean, my view is that there's no sharp distinction between science and technology. One moves into the other or blends into the other. Um, and then the issue of values in science and technology, I mean that uh, values in technology on the one hand and values in science on the other, they too tend to, um, to run into each other. And that's obviously quite closely related to Kuhn's work. In the IT industry at one point, I think it was Bill Gates said that we would only need about, was it, what was it, one megabyte uh, to run mostly everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not easy to predict any of this. Back in um, sort of those days, which isn't really very long ago, uh, the amount of computing power was just tiny compared with what we've got now. And moving into the ethics, um, you've done a lot of work in what is known as the precautionary principle and the proactionary principle. Uh, in your book, Nanoethics, you give a, a discourse on this. Can you, can you give us just an idea of, of what this means? Well, the precautionary principle, um, there are quite a lot of different formulations of it, but basically it's the position that even if there is not conclusive evidence that some particular, particular activity is going to be harmful, um, that there can be good grounds for either not doing it or at least holding off until you know more about uh, what the what the consequences of that action are. Now that view has been criticized a lot, particularly in the English speaking world and I guess particularly in the US, as um, a view that would pretty well stop all uh, scientific research, stop all development because it's just too um, uh, well, it's, it's just taking too careful an approach and we have to take risks, we know that. Uh, all developments, all activities involve some risk. Um, and it's often claimed that cost-benefit analysis is a better way to go and that you look at the cost, you look at the benefits and then you um, proceed rather than taking a precautionary approach. Now my argument is that um, cost of alternative to it is, is something much more like um, a gung-ho approach where you do something and if there are problems then you worry about them later. <laughs> uh, a cost-benefit analysis seems to me to be 
in the middle and something that um, the precautionary principle would, would actually advocate, although perhaps putting more emphasis on the costs than the benefits than normally happens. Uh, but I see it, I don't see cost benefit analysis and the precautionary principle as being intention. It's more the precautionary principle as opposed to, um, you know, an approach which is a bit like, you know, suck it and see. And that's the one that I think is uh, probably the dominant one at the moment. In, in fact, you, you've used this term in your writings, the gung ho principle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I do actually call it something else. You know, whatever yeah. it is, you know, and uh, we'll we'll see what we'll just we'll deal with the consequences later because we're essentially smart enough. Mm, mm. That's right. And that um, when I was giving a talk a few years ago in the U.S., I was actually challenged on this point, and and um, the view was expressed that we shouldn't worry too much about the dangers of what we do because litigation will sort all of that out in the longer term. <laughs> that struck me as moderately dangerous. <laughs> moderately, huh? In, yeah. This is the, this kind of uh, thinking would brings us to two, two things. One is Hume's uh, critique of the habits of the human mind, like we have habits expecting something to happen, we call, we, and we think it's causality. And then the other one is ethics, but let's talk about Hume for a moment. Uh, the, the ability to be able to actually discover causal mechanisms is not so easy, is it? No, that's certainly true. Um, but we, I mean, the, we can make educated guesses on, on what the consequences of activities are in certain circumstances if we're careful. Uh, one of the objections raised against the precautionary principle is that it's just so difficult, notoriously difficult in fact, to accurately make predictions. Um, that's true, but on the other hand there are certain... I mean, we have to make predictions. We don't have a choice. Um, we make predictions all the time. Uh, and there are lots of cases where we can make them and providing we're careful um, we can be pretty we can be have reasonable confidence in them and one example I use sometimes is making the prediction that new technologies are going to increase monitoring and surveillance and decrease privacy now that given what we know about uh, the way technology, the current technology is used to limit people's privacy and increase surveillance. What we know about the way technology is developing, um, that's a pretty reasonable uh, prediction to make. I mean, it might be wrong, but it's almost certainly right, and we can base that on what's happened in the past. And I think there are lots of cases where, where we can do that sort of thing. So again, to clarify, your early hypothesis was that surveillance will be used in control by uh, concentrations of power like a government or a corporation or institution and then the evidence now shows that that is indeed also true yeah that's right yeah yeah and that the situation that it's going to go further down that path I don't think there's much doubt about that um, and it's not only, it's certainly not only driven by technology, it's also, uh, well, in corporations, it's partly driven by um, 